My name is Chris Newfield. I am the director of research of the Independent Social Research Foundation, which is the sponsor of this event, and sort of the, the proud affiliates of these three folks, starting with Phil Crockett Thomas at the end, who is one of our independent scholars, uh, really recently, just a couple of years ago. So the rapidity of this product, this publication, is also quite impressive. So I'm going to do a short introduction, and then I'm going to introduce each of them individually uh, as I speak. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we live in an age of lowered expectations, where government tells us to curb our enthusiasm for justice or social rights or climate restoration or racial equality or, in our topic this evening, a prison abolition. A column that summed up the trend in writing that, uh, that for a few years, some governments thought their job was to give people things. Now, all governments see their job as taking things away. One effect, probably intentional, is to push us to give up our visions of transformation and instead to make do with reforms that change very liberal, little. This rule of thumb does seem to apply to universities and childcare and some other things that we could name. It does not, however, apply to prisons. In the United States, the sentencing project describes 2023 as the 50th year of an unprecedented surge in mass incarceration. The US prison population is currently 2 million, with 5 million under supervision by the criminal legal system in total. The count of incarcerated people 50 years ago was, by contrast, 360,000. The number of women in prison was multiplied in this period by a factor of 17. Mass incarceration is built on racial disparity. The share of black adults in state or federal prison approaches a full percent of the total black population. It's about 901 for every 100,000 population. Black men are six times more likely to be in prison than white men, and Latino men 2.5 times more likely. The United States famously has about the world's highest incarceration rate, so you might be expecting the numbers that I, I just described. But what about Britain? Well, the world's number two country for mass incarceration is the one to which the British government would like to send its refugees, Rwanda. And then back home, the incarceration rate in England and Wales is 136 for 100,000, which is not as far as you might expect below the rate for whites in the United States, which is about 180 out of 100,000. Mass incarceration afflicts any society in, in which it has taken root. So these numbers say nothing about how it afflicts the individuals, the families, and the communities on which it draws. Happily, many people and organizations have stepped forward to duke it out with the prison industrial complex. We have a wide range of excellent critiques of mass incarceration policy, and I'm especially drawn to those that show that incarceration does not make society safer, and rather than expressing justice, hollows justice out. But the prison abolition movement goes far deeper than policy critique. It asks us to start to imagine our society from a completely different place. Phil Rocket Thomas's book project, Abolition Science Fiction, is a practical attempt to rewrite our own imaginations so that we can picture our society functioning completely coherently without prisons. Phil cites Tom Moylan's writing on recent utopian thinking. These were literary critical utopias which reject utopia as blueprint while preserving it as a dream. In other words, we are to change not only policy, but also what we can feel collectively about our societies and also what we can collectively imagine. The idea is to make all of us, in Avery Gordon's phrase, unavailable for servitude. Phil's book project, in my opinion, shows that we can't do without the literary imagination to get us there. Okay, so this is our 26th launch of a book associated with an ISRF fellow. ISRF fellows often study agency that persists against impossible odds, and also study the social conditions that help or hinder that agency. The topics range from social rights and economic sub subjectivity to disability studies, green transitions, migration, political economy and race, and most things in between. I'll mention just one parallel project, which we launched in, uh, in the hall, not outside it, a few months ago, this is January. 
and that is H. Patton's book on Jamaican reggae dancehall dance. British colonial practice was designed to instill psychological as well as bodily subjugation in Jamaica and the rest of the empire, and yet dance refused both forms of subjugation, and given the power of occupying forces, expressed an insistent heroism and agency in the population that was not negated on the collective level, even if it was contained politically and legally for generations. Dance didn't only keep hope alive, it kept power alive. It kept certainty in a transformed future alive. So I think abolition science fiction is representing the same kind of everyday counter forces at work, the kind that uh, we really real, <laughs> really real. I wrote really real as just a way of emphasizing how real this future that we're imagining is actually <laughs> going to be. <clears throat> the kind that really will one day get us out of this. Okay, so as for the format, we'll follow our usual structure, which is that Phil is the principal author, organizer of this collective product. Um, we'll start us off. Um, she'll talk for 15 minutes or however, we're flexible. And then we'll hear from our two commentators, Ali Issa and Sarah Lamble. And then I'll invite Phil to respond, if she's so inclined, and we'll open it up for discussion, which will be followed by continued activity at the bar behind us and also some pizza later on if you're all invited to stay for both of those things. Okay, on to Phil. Phil Crockett Thomas has a PhD in visual sociology from Goldsmiths, the University of London. She is currently a lecturer in criminology at the University of Stirling, where her key research interests are the sociology of justice, criminalization, harm, and punishment, prison abolition and transformative justice, arts and culture, post-structuralist and feminist philosophy, science and technology studies, and collaborative and creative research methods. <laughs> just a bunch I'm just warming up with okay. you. Right? So, <laughs> Don't start feeling like I'm saying too much because it's only going to get worse. <laughs> Phil previously lectured in cultural studies at the London Contemporary Dance School, Trinity Laban, and the Northern School of Contemporary Dance. She has also worked as a graduate tutor in criminology and sociology at Goldsmiths. During 2021-22, Phil undertook an ISRF Independent Scholar Fellowship on the topic of prison break, imagining alternatives to the prison in the UK hosted by the University of Glasgow, and from 2017 to 2022, Phil worked at Glasgow as the research associate on the ESCR-funded Distant Voices project. Alongside more traditional social science approaches, her research methodology includes creative writing, collaging, and filmmaking. Her fiction and poetry have been performed on BBC Radio 4 and published by Ambit, Adjacent Pineapple, and SoFi. Her satirical play, The Girls Get Younger Every Year, about sexual harassment in higher education, has been used internationally as a workshopping tool. Okay, I'll stop there. Just <laughs> <laughs> okay. you know, Please join me in welcoming. Uh, here we are. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the London launch of our book, Abolition Science Fiction. It's really amazing to see so many friends here um, and also um, some people who are involved in making the book which I have promised not to out but if you want to out yourselves please do. Um, first I want to say some thanks so thanks to all the contributors to the book um, including my book here sorry just immediately <laughs> that I mean you would have found out about that. Um, uh, thanks to um, Nat Walpole for her uh, beautiful illustrations in the book and thanks to Mae Fredman for her design um, thanks so much to the ISRF for funding this project and hosting this launch. Thanks to Ali and Lambo for agreeing to respond. So the book was written with activists and scholars involved in uh, prison abolition and transformative justice from across the UK uh, during a series of creative writing workshops, some online, some in person. Um, I just initially planned to make like a little pamphlet, but it then kind of grew legs and turned into this, this book. Um, I'll just talk through the structure of the book briefly for those of you who are not familiar with it. So the first half is um, uh, short science fiction stories, um, imagining more just features written by the participants in the project, most of whom hadn't written fiction before. Um, and the stories are, are, are grouped into loose themes, so for example some of them are about prison breaks. Um, and then 
uh, these little themed chunks are followed by uh, discussion chapters, which um, kind of weave together um, extracts from our conversations around the stories as they were being written and shared. Um, so I guess the primary idea behind the book is that it's a learning resource, so it should be possible for someone picking up the book uh, who's interested in exploring um, justice issues in creative ways to like use some of the, um, um, set the kind of similar approach to the one that we did. So to help that, the second half of the book is um, creative writing exercises of different lengths and also ideas about how to structure workshops and stuff <coughs> for people who haven't done it before. So I really want to stress that the book is, um, uh, you know, it's based on our discussions about the stories as we wrote and shared them. So it's an expression of collective knowledge and um, it's, our, it's our analysis of the book. Um, so yeah, it kind of presents this kind of collective analysis, even though I had the great pleasure of um, getting to edit it all together. The book's free. Um, there's a free ebook as well, um, and um, you know we sent out 300 um, paper copies all over the world. Um, it's been downloaded over 2,000 times, which is like very exciting. You know, it's great that things are being used and read. Um, and, and I've had lots of really nice uh, uh, emails and stuff from people, you know, using it in their activism, um, in prison reading groups, um, yeah, in their teaching. Um, someone got in touch saying they're going to use it in a project that's about reimagining space stations. So it's, it's all happening. If you are doing something with it, just kind of get in touch and let me know. Okay, uh, two, um, traveling back in time to tell some project origin stories. Um, so one story starts on a small angry planet where people are punished by the theft of their lifetime. So as a genre, while science fiction involves the construction of other worlds in which some things are radically different, um, it always invites us to consider um, that world in relationship to the here and now. So yeah, lots of science fiction authors like Ray Bradbury and Sam Delaney have argued that science fiction is about the present rather than the future. Another origin story starts with recognition, and I think I was reading Angela Davis, um, who commented that for abolitionists, the urgency and the energy that's needed to document and critique the harms of prison and other forms of punishment um, can kind of leave you with very little left in the tank, like no um, capacity for developing sort of alternative visions and practices of justice that could be really transformative. So it's hard to do that kind of crucial imaginative work when you're, you know, always firefighting, or you know, endlessly defending abolition as a as a position against the sort of what about the rapist argument. Um, an alternative origin story starts with reading the speculative fiction anthology Octavia's Brood, that was named in honor of the black feminist um, science fiction author Octavia E. Butler, and um, written by um, activists um, in the U.S. And. <laughs> Um, so the book's editors, Adrian Marie Brown and Willie de Amarisha, describe their activism um, as a form of social science, sorry, as a form of science fiction, because of the way it entails moving beyond the boundaries of what seems realistic or possible. And I really like Joan Haran's term for that, so she, she kind of dubbed this um, imagine activism. A final origin story starts with a sweaty rave in a cave in the utopian society of Zion. So when The Matrix Reloaded came out in 2003, I remember being incredibly embarrassed, but also excited um, by this vision of utopia as a sort of euphoric communion of anonymous bodies, sort of dancing against the dark times. Um, and I think that this kind of initial embarrassment wasn't just that I was a teenager, but because there's something inherently embarrassing about utopia, despite its political necessity. Um, it makes us vulnerable to say that this is what I desire and value, and this is how I wish the world could be, and this is what I'm willing to fight for. So it's much easier to talk about our dystopian fears, um, you know, to talk about how bad things are, and, 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 and warn about how much worse they could become. And I think that is also really important too. They both have a place. So after the horrors of 20th century totalitarianism, with its blueprint utopias, um, that kind of Chris was alluding to, um, you know, uh, contemporary readers tend not to buy into happy clappy sort of perfect utopias. Further, you know, utopia plus abolition is like a particularly hard sell. Um, so when we were writing stories um, for the project, we drew on um, 
Tom Moylan's work um, and his idea of the critical utopia. Um, so the kind of knowing utopia which dreams up a better world um, and doesn't shy away from presenting the ambiguities and the tensions of its dark side. And I just want to share a really nice quote from H.G. Wells that's in the book, um, that's from 1905. So he writes, in a modern utopia there will indeed be no perfection. In utopia there must also be friction, conflict and waste, but the waste will be enormously less than in our world. Okay, three, futures. <laughs> so this project took inspiration from fiction, but um, it focused on fiction as a verb, so fictioning. Um, so the way that writing fiction can open up a space to imagine the world anew, and in doing so, hopefully transform our practices in the present. Um, relatedly, Ernst Bloch, um, he conceptualized utopia in terms of a sort of lively dialectic between the sort of abstract or imagined and the concrete or practiced utopia. Um, the scholar Ruhr Benjamin um, uses the phrase the carceral imaginary to describe the pervasiveness of containment and exclusion as our sort of primary social response to harm and conflict. And so I've been thinking about the stories written in the project as sort of illustrating the abolitionist imaginary. Um, so, for example, here are some of the plots. Future one. People become able to walk through walls. How will society reorganize itself to adapt to this? Design new kinds of prison which are wallless or develop new forms of safety and ownership? Future two, a suicidal man can't kill himself because people have become telepathic and he's prevented from dying because he's more useful alive. Future three, prisons and police are no longer cost effective and are abolished. A municipal heritage warden goes to work patrolling the monument to the final policeman who served. Um, so there's like a dark humour, pessimism and sort of um, irony in some of these stories that I find really interesting. and. Sort of when I have a time freezing device, I'd really like to explore this further. Um, so, you know, maybe it it kind of maybe this performs a sort of awareness of um, the limit of our imagination. You know how you know how do we get to abolition? How do we kill the cop in our heads? But I think you know it it could also partially maybe be down to sort of um, differences in rhetorical traditions. So, kind of talking about love and affirmation is more acceptable in some cultures, like in the US, I'd argue, than it is in the UK. So perhaps, again, this kind of um, dark humor signifies this kind of embarrassment in naming utopia that I sort of mentioned before. Um, but I'm also thinking about this kind of differences and, and thinking about the contemporary moment where I think, you know, there is like an increasing number of, um, and, I mean, maybe Lamb will have their own thoughts about this, but. I think it's a, it's a good sign that um, abolitionists are more often now reflecting on the, the kind of jurisdictional context that they operate in, rather than sort of um, treating the US justice system as a sort of um, universal model. Um, so for example, in the UK, you know, um, currently a small angry island, thinking about prison abolition um, in relation to border abolition and empire is very fruitful as Gracie Mae Bradley and um, Luke, de Nora, de, Luke de Nonora have, have recently sort of demonstrated in their book of border abolition. <clears throat> Future four. Um, a person spends some time inside a virtual reality simulation which creates a safe space for revenge. They confront the avatar of someone who's harmed them, smashing them to pieces, then they return and confront them again. I think stories like this one really demonstrate that abolitionists are deeply concerned with mutual social responsibility and the consequences of, to harm. So that far from not taking harm seriously in advocating for the abolition of prisons and alternatives to punishment, many people involved in abolition and transformative justice are survivors of harm with a really nuanced understanding of justice um, and revenge. Um, future five, I'm getting there, sorry. A pot plant on a prison office filing cabinet gets into the cracks in the prison infrastructure and ruins the building at an, at an imperceptible pace. So several of the stories reckon with non-human agency and heroes, the realities of climate change and the possibility of life in capitalist ruins, to borrow a phrase from Anna Singh, um, kind of pitting slow resistance against the slow violence of prison. Future six, a colony of survivors from the eugenics wars hold regular naming ceremonies where people choose a new name to represent change and growth. There's community accountability, recognition and appreciation process as part of this ceremony. So I think broadly these short stories share visions of social justice, reflecting our workshop discussions about how education, food provision, housing, etc., could and should be different. And you know, criminal justice was always just kind of one part of this, um, reflecting 
um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's insistence that abolition requires that we change one thing, which is everything. So as we debated um, in our workshops, this change everything is not like a tabula rasa, destroy everything and start again, but um, to quote Gilmore uh, again, kind of building the um, future from the present in all the ways that we can. Um, this kind of idea of practicing um, an everyday abolition, which I really kind of have learned a lot from Lamble about, um, knowing that we, the change that we kind of seek might not come within our own lifetime. So yeah, I'm gonna end there. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, our first commentator is uh, Ali Issa, who is a contemporary artist, educator, and public programmer. He is the learning and partic participation manager at Autograph, where he works with schools, young people, and marginalized groups. His practice spans over 10 years of collaborative and participatory work using sculpture, installation, performance, video, and photography. Currently, he is a lecturer in fine art at Goldsmiths, University of London, and also one half of the performance art duo, Lloyd Corporation. My new favorite name for this part of the art duo. Thank you for coming. Thanks. So I wasn't part, of, like a collaborator on the project, but uh, so I'll give like the kind of uh, reading of someone who wasn't from the outside, but me and Phil have known each other for a really long time. How long? Ten years. More than, that. More than ten years. Um, and we kind of studied together when Phil was doing her PhD and I was uh, an MA student, we were both in uh, visual sociology at, at Goldsmith. So this is like a really great, um, it's been really nice to, to do this, uh, to read the book uh, and to be able to kind of reflect on it because I've kind of seen the evolution of, of the ideas, I guess, over, over a really long period of time. Um, but yeah, my I guess my kind of reflections come from uh, reading the book, knowing Phil's work, but also kind of working a lot in uh, not context of abolition, um, but working a lot with marginalised uh, communities um, through arts and participatory and engagement work. Um, and also working a lot now in a university, I'm a, a lecturer at Goldsmiths in the art department. So I work a lot with students um, and I particularly work a lot in kind of collective um, practice with students kind of trying to organize uh, from the ground kind of upwards to see how we can make interventions and change within a system that I think has become increasingly carceral and extractive uh, and really kind of problematic and racist on many levels um, and then I guess after me you'll hear um, from someone who's actually been involved in, in the project so um, I think the, the thing that I wanted to start with was a line kind of right at the beginning of the book where um, you say, Phil, we hope that reading the book feels like being part of a conversation with comrades. Um, and I think that was my first kind of reflection on it, was that it, it didn't feel like a book where I was um, kind of sort of being dictated to. It felt very much like I was kind of being given this really generous viewpoint into this kind of process of dialogue. Um, and it was really kind of brilliant to kind of be able to move between the stories that were, were written, the discussions that came after them, the prompts that were given, uh, and then how that kind of moved into uh, like exercises that could then be taken forward into your own work and into your own context. Um, and I think that's something that's actually really difficult and doesn't happen that much within particularly kind of academic writing, that ability to actually take a project and uh, really kind of give an insight into um, a kind of conversation and often like quite messy conversations that are kind of not linear uh, and I remain kind of open-ended and like unsolved. So that was kind of something that I just thought I actually wanted to say right at the beginning is that there's a real like generosity in the book from all the different kind of voices that have been, um, that are kind of included. Um, and I think part of that is also that it's like, it feels really, it's very accessible in the way that it moves the stories and the, the reflections and the responses uh, kind of move between lived experience and theory. And I felt like as I was kind of reading through the book, I wasn't kind of in this structure where you're like, okay, this is the theory that explains these people's um, experiences. 
You're right. Yeah, I've got lots of was at the gate over there trying to press the buzzer to get here. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you found it. Thank you so much. I love it. <laughs> um, cool. Get get comfortable. It's only, it only goes on for another five hours. So. <laughs> um, so I thought that yeah, I thought this was something also really kind of um, brilliant about the book that you kind of move between lived experience and theory, and it feels really kind of mutually constitutive. And I think that's something that um, I find always really difficult in kind of how you actually kind of um, communicate participatory work that often does have these kind of movements between these very different spheres. Um, and I think particularly in the kind of context of abolition where, um, and prisons where you've got kind of also kind of really geographically um, marginalised communities, I thought that this book really kind of found a way to weave between these spaces. Um, and I think that's something really, really sort of generative. Um, I thought that um, kind of reading the book that there was this sense of a research process and a kind of methodology um, that remains really live, open-ended and unresolved. And that's something that, again, I kind of felt like I really connect with in a lot of the work that um, I do with marginalised groups where research can sometimes be kind of difficult in the way that it tries to fix things, it tries to kind of make things concrete, coherent and readable and collaborative processes are kind of not necessarily like this, they're kind of in, inherently unstable and being able to kind of hold that in the way that the work um, uh, happens I think is really important, being really attuned to the fact that unexpected, improvised, transient kind of experiences are at the core of the work. Um, and also that this is a kind of transformative process, that these, this writing was not just about communicating something but it was about a process of transformation. Um, that was something that just came through each of those kind of stories that, that we read. Um, there was a quote uh, that came from Mike which says, abolition is always transitional in a sense. It's in the nature of this work that you don't know if you're going to get there. This was written into my first understanding of abolition by Thomas Matheson talking about the unfinished. So I think that sense of the unfinished meant that the stories can hold these kind of complex, complex layered and often very contradictory lived experiences that people are facing within prisons but also in lots of marginalised contexts, especially where trauma and victimisation is present. These are really <coughs> difficult experiences to be able to kind of create space for and they're often uh, kind of in unsafe, that it's often unsafe to share these things, especially with teachers or lecturers or researchers. So I think a kind of really key aspect of fiction and science fiction in this and writing uh, was about creating this kind of safe space for these complex experiences to unfold and for trauma to be worked through in ways that um, are generative. Um, the focus on the imagination I thought was really important. There was um, a quote from Jackie Wang, imagination is excess is that which can never be contained by the prison, that which, which will always exceed it. Um, this was something I really connected to because I thought about the way that the writing and the stories were not just about imagination as this thing that's sort of like in our heads, but is actually about a form of living, that the process of imagination brings into life forms of living. It makes lives. Um, there was a line in the story Moments that said, quote, I'm in a liminal space, somewhere between writing and being written. And this connects really to something that has been at the core of a lot of work that I've done where we've thought about representation and representation not being a process where you're representing something outside but being something that's constitutive. Um, I work a lot with photography and other art forms and we talk a lot about how kind of making photographs, particularly portraiture, self-portraiture, is a way of kind of bringing to life um, a way that you want to be in the world uh, that's different from kind of normative uh, ways of representing that you're being, that are kind of enforced upon you. Um, constructing new subjectivities. I also thought about this kind of idea about what's contained and how this kind of book 
and the process kind of opened up um, through the imagination. Uh, and it made me think about a quote from Bell Hooks about the classroom, which is a space that I work in a lot. Um, quote, the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. And I think, I feel like that's still really true, even given how kind of constrained and constricted the spaces that we work in are. And there was lots of references through stories about kind of the different structures within prisons that I think are kind of reflected in so many spaces, this everyday kind of context that you were talking about with abolition. Uh, just to the point of like, in universities, chairs are fixed to the floor. You know, we can't even create kind of, we have to do so much to kind of create new ways of even kind of sitting together. But that actually imagination and what kind of comes out always kind of exceeds that. Um, it's never quite fully possible to be completely constrained in the ways that we um, that we are. Um, there was another line kind of quite close to the beginning, um, which I think was also really important from for me. The stories are not all explicitly about prison abolition, but all of them explore the underlying question of how we can live well together. So I think something that really came out for me in the work was how the context of abolition uh, and prisons is so much broader than maybe what we might think of in terms of someone who is not involved in these kind of conversations explicitly. But the kind of, all of these other kind of considerations around care, living together, being together, connectedness, relatedness. Um, and I think particularly kind of, I was really kind of resonant with stories about spaces of joy that are created within prisons. Um, there was a line from Josie Tophill's piece, 5am DMC with an alien, which I'm going to quote. Uh, one day the guard was trying to take his speaker, um, so he threw it up on the rafter where no one could get it. At first it was just like everyone razzing the guards, because it reverberated through the prison, something in the acoustics up there. So everyone was dancing, but, soon as, but as soon as they were moving, moving together, sharing joy, there was no going back. And I just loved how that within that story, it just opened up this idea of like creating, once that kind of light has been lit, um, it kind of opens up a whole new space. And in the discussion notes, love and joy are literally contagious, creating connection. And I think for me, that's something that is like really at the center of all of the kind of collaborative work that I do, whether it's with students or I work a lot with people in the uh, asylum process, often in those spaces, um, the kind of logics of the institutions that you work within um, don't really value joy as an inherently important thing. And there's often people are subjected to kind of the most bare kind of forms of life. Um, and in kind of, you f I feel like you spend so much time sort of justifying why people having joy or spaces of joy is actually just valuable. Uh, with other kinds of like logics around like economic things like um, skills or um, you know all kinds of other logics that play into it and I think that the, the space of fiction really allowed those kind of things to, to emerge which I think is really really valuable. Um, a couple more things quickly. Um, I thought that there was a um, a lot about how fiction opens up the possibility for cracks in the present that we often can't see because punitive systems are designed to wear us down, exhaust, make us cynical and accept. Um, and I think this really came out in uh, River Ellen McCaskill's piece, A, F a Fine Scene, uh, where they talk about sanitary towels being used to carry intel. Um, and there's a quote which says, the administration keeps stocking them, blindly fulfilling contracts while the prison fills up with fewer biowomen and more and more inorganics. So this thing that is kind of becoming redundant is still being purchased by this institution. And I, that just made me think, anyone who works in a university has probably seen that, like the amount of just like <coughs> random stuff that is still bought and is just there, like broken photocopiers or unused things. And it just made me kind of think about how like this story really opened up the fact that even though it can be really exhausting, you were mentioning Angela Davis before, like the work can be really exhausting to kind of do advocacy and activism work. Um, there are these cracks in the system that actually 
need to be made vocalised and kind of represented, and I think this story kind of began to do that. Um, the last thing that I was going to kind of mention that really came to me was um, how the book posed critical conversations about collectivity. Um, I thought this was really important. I work a lot with thinking through how collective practices, particularly within the arts, can be um, a kind of address or challenge towards what is often a kind of thoroughly individualized system. Um, and, um, oh, I thought more people might come in to join us. Um, and yet, I think that often that conversation cannot be maybe sort of led in the most critical way. Um, collectivity can be extremely difficult, it can be really challenging, um, it can um, involve both liberation, but it can also involve conflict, it can involve um, collapse, failure. Um, and so where I kind of, in a lot of the work I do, sort of advocate for collective approaches to art making, collective approaches to um, education and pedagogy, um, I'm also aware, kind of reading the book, I was thinking about how important it is to kind of have a sense of criticality um, within that. And there was a number of stories that kind of thought through this relationship between um, individuals and collectives within that context and um, generally kind of the way in which fiction allows those contradictions to exist and to kind of play out their logics in a way that doesn't just immediately sort of um, collapse the kind of like political ambition you know that you want to pursue. So I thought that there was something really important about how the stories held tensions and complexities and contradictions and then were kind of worked between <coughs> all of the um, different collaborators in a way that felt really generative. So I just thought it was a really, it was really brilliant being able to spend the last period of time reading it and thank you both for being involved and convening it and everyone else who was involved. Um, I didn't say much about the, the drawings but the drawings were like really beautiful as well. Um, and yeah, I'm going to finish that. Thanks. Um, next is Sarah Lample. Uh, she holds a PhD from Kent Law School and a Master of Arts in Criminology from the University of Toronto. She joined the School of Law at Birkbeck College, University of London in 2009, leading the development of criminology there as well as the establishment of the Department of Criminology in 2016. Prior to coming to Birkbeck, Lamble taught politics, law, and gender studies at the University of Trent in Canada and also at Kent Law School. She has previously worked as an advocate for prisoners and has been involved in anti-violence and anti-poverty community work in Canada and the UK. Currently, she is co-editor of the Social Justice Book Series with Routledge, serves as an international advisory editor for theoretical criminology, and is a steering group member for the Birkbeck Gender and Sexuality Studies Group. Lamble is co-founder of the Bent Mars Project, a collective that coordinates a letter writing program for LGBTQ plus prisoners in Britain, and is also an organizer with Abolitionist Futures. Lamble has previously served as an editorial board member for the journal Feminist Legal Studies, and is a trustee for the Institute of Crime and Justice Policy Research. Lamble, pleasure to have you. Um, so first, I just want to say a huge thank you to Phil um, for inviting me um, and for organizing this amazing project and like the care at which you took throughout the whole process was incredible. Um, and I also want to thank the Independent Social Research Foundation for funding this great project. I wish we had a hundred more projects like this. Um, when Phil first asked me to participate in the project, I was, I was pretty sure I was going to say no. Um, because I thought I'm not a fiction writer. I've, I've read some science fiction, but like I don't really know much about it. You know, I've got a lot of pulls on my time. Um, so I was like, this is probably not for me. Um, but I was intrigued and I was curious. Um, and so I said yes. And I'm so glad that I did. Um, I've absolutely loved being part of this project in a way that I think I didn't quite fully anticipate. 
Um, I learned a lot from the process of being part of the workshops, but also from like the conversations with the other participants, um, and just the process of how it unfolded, and also from reading the final book. Um, there was something about the process that I found really enlivening, um, doing the writing exercises together like on the spot and then sharing your writing with other people without, you know, academics are used to like, we polish and we polish and we polish and then we have somebody peer review something like 10 times before it ever gets published. And so there's something actually quite vulnerable that I'm just gonna write my thoughts and then we're gonna share them together um, in this kind of tentative way. Um, and it's, I think that's both exciting, but it also creates a kind of productive vulnerability that I think is really important when it comes to experimenting with new ideas and possibilities. Um, so recently in another context, a colleague was talking about the need for both humility and courage in writing. Um, so the humility to know that you have something to contribute, even though it may not change the world, it's still worth ar articulating. Um, and the courage to uh, express it. And I think I felt both of those things during the process and was quite moved by that experience. Um, and as I was rereading the collection this weekend in the summer sunshine, um, I was struck by a few things. Um, the first, and this sort of resonates with what Ali was talking about, is the collection has a lot of queer joy in it. Um, there's some pessimism and, you know, some, you know, but I think there's a lot of queer joy. And when I say queer joy, I'm not referring to queer in the kind of identitarian sense of like LGBT people or identities. I'm referring to queer in its kind of political um, ethos. And so for me, queer joy refers to a kind of dissident playfulness, a pleasure in the unconventional, the non-normative, the perverse, um, the delight and joy that comes from rebelliousness, the upending of power dynamics, the turning of the normal upside down. I saw this queer joy in Lizzie's story, the Seed, where the rebellious plant is smiling as it intricately grows its way through to slow destruction and dismantling of the prison infrastructure. I felt it in the pleasure of a mango nap on the Tower of Fruit in Kara's Beastie Blitz. <laughs> It was in a cockroach delivering a neon whip to aid in a prison escape in, just, in Josie's story. It was the queerness of the child's self-naming ceremony in Justice's story, Day 62 on Earth. And there's many other examples, and Ali gave a good one as well. Um, but those are just a few that have lingered with me, and I would encourage you to read the book, uh, or reread the book and find more. Um, and I think as someone who's been doing abolitionist organizing for 20 years now, um, I often feel quite acutely the kind of collective heaviness of doing this work for a long time, of feeling the challenge of trying to build a world without prisons, without police, without punishment, without surveillance, and particularly in a context where it feels like punitive, punitiveness is sort of increasing you know, it can feel very daunting and quite frankly depressing. It's that kind of energy, the tiredness that you're trying to fight the system. And it's like, where is the other energy going to come from? Um, and so for this reason, I think we need that queer joy because I think it both opens up something for the process of imagining, but I also think the queer joy is partly what sustains and nourishes us in these kind of difficult times. And so for me, Abolition is about many things, but it's partly about asking that question of how do we want to govern ourselves or how do we want to live collectively? Um, and how we, do we want to do that differently to how we do it now in the sense of like, how do we do that without prisons, without police, without punishment? And how do we get there? So as Phil asks, how can we move beyond recognizing the need to abolish prisons to actually abolishing them? What might the steps be that lead from one to the other? And one of the things I really love about this collection is I think it grapples with those questions in different ways and on many different levels. And it also poses for every question it tries to kind of do a tentative answer, it poses 10 other questions, which open up so much. Um, so for, one, for example, one of my favorite questions, discussions questions, is posed at the end of the expansion section, which is as follows. A virus has made humans telepathic. What kind of social norms and rules are we going to have to have to establish in order to live together without constant drama? <laughs> and I love this question because it invites us to sit with the complexity of how we're going to govern ourselves 
in the face of serious challenges, you know, not that a telepathy virus is immediately on the horizon, but we do actually, you know, the everyday grittiness of how we deal with conflict, how we deal with harm, how we deal with difficulties in our lives is something actually in the here and now that we grapple with. And it can be a way of thinking through that for working towards this model of, of how we want to be in the future. Um, and I don't know any abolitionists who think that there will be no harm or violence in the abolitionist future that we're seeking. But most abolitionists I know want to identify and address that harm differently. We don't want our responses to be driven by punishment and violence, by organized social abandonment, by systems that require and entrench vast social inequalities. Instead, we want to center possibility, care, collectivity, uh, creativity, and human flourishing while reckoning with the complexities of living together, which is what I felt both in the process of this project, um, but also in the stories that were published in the book. And so I'm thinking just of some of the stories, again, a couple examples that grapple with this. So the park by Chris, which imagines the afterlife of a repurposed prison in ways that different people who enter the people's activity and uh, recreation center have different feelings about engaging with that space. I think about the monument by Dave, which commemorates the day of abolition in a future without prisons. I think about the story of Moments, which devises a video assimilation to enable people to work through feelings of vengeance. These stories, I think, are grappling with these questions of what a future without prisons might look like, but not in a kind of romanticized way. Um, but how do we deal with the legacy of prisons in their aftermath? And how do we actually let go of those things that continue to kind of pull us back to the logics, the carceral logics and the punitive logics. Um, so in this sense, I think all of the stories in the collection feel very generative. They imagine different ways of getting to a new place, a new structure, and a new way of being. And most importantly, they invite us to contemplate different possibilities from what we have now, and in doing so, open up something otherwise for the future. Thanks. We have we live in a racist society. I mean, we we all know that. Um, I, again, I think it's that thing of like, you know, there's like racial discrimination at all points of contact with the criminal justice system, and you know, people being held in remand. I think there was research recently that showed that people were black people were more likely to be held on remand even before they've been you know charged with the thing. So can you speak up slightly? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, in terms of how, yeah, ideas on how we. Uh, have a less racist society. I mean, I can keep trying and all these. Sorry, I'm not being very eloquent. Um, yeah, yeah. Does someone else want to come in? Um, <clears throat> can you say the question again? Just I, I, I was just saying. I, I think it was 2018, um, but for the first time in British history, black and brown prisoners made up the, the most significant portion of the prison population in Britain even though we make up a tiny subset of British yeah. society. How does the work um, analyze that or, or challenge that or, or bring the highlight of that at all? Yeah. I mean, I, I think kind of maybe what Phil said is like really important, which is that that's something that is connected to wider forms of marginalization yeah. um, of black communities. Yeah. I mean, you know, I. I've worked a lot in uh, schools um, from like all levels um, and you know I guess also in other contexts like uh, people in the asylum process um, and I think that there's so many connections between you know marginalization of black communities and things like relationships to uh, people in care, uh, people in different kinds of immigration situations, uh, educational inequality, these things start from a much kind of earlier point and in a way I did feel like the situation in prisons has some specifics around the ways that black communities are policed but I think they're also to do with much bigger questions of structural racism and inequality and marginalization and I feel like um, I guess for me the book is about kind of creating giving some kind of tools practices that could maybe be implemented more widely. So when I was reading it, I was kind of thinking, I, I work at the moment on a project with um, BIPOC, uh, black, indigenous, POC uh, students who kind of came together because of 
the racist experiences they were facing within the education system, which is in universities, but also draws on their experiences from primary school all the way through. And um, I think that, you know, I was kind of thinking there's, there's so much in kind of the use of fiction as a kind of method of like opening up ways we might see the world differently that I would use, that I, I haven't really used that kind of thing. It's been more like, um, you know, other kinds of art, arts methods. But I think that kind of art creativity plays a role in kind of how we can galvanize people uh, particularly black people in those systems to actually sort of start to kind of have more agency um, and also be involved in shaping um, structures, institutions that we have to kind of operate within uh, differently. You know, I think for me one of the things that I feel like I face a lot is the fact that, you know, marginalised groups and communities are hardly ever involved in shaping the kinds of structures and systems that they're involved in. And it's like constantly this like, um, you know, imposition of like intervention. So like the, the, the problem that you take, like the, the standard thing would be like some sort of policy intervention. And these hardly ever actually involve like engaged processes of participation, uh, both between like people who are in academia, in activist group, um, community organizing, as well as people that are being marginalised who might be victims of these structures and systems um, and people that might work in policy or politics and so I think that's sort of another area where I was thinking like uh, when I've seen that kind of work happen it can often be like kind of quite dry and like people don't get engaged with it but this kind of process of like we're going to write science fiction and we're going to think through these scenarios without limitations um, plays just a really central role in how we can actually like try to organise differently and I think that's probably going to be the way that we can actually start to make tangible differences um, in order to address these things that are, you know, as you, as you were kind of saying, like really, um, you know, deeply scarring situations of violence against black communities and, and others. I mean, like the other intersection I've worked a lot um, at over the last few years is between race and, and disability. So there's a huge connection between people um, who are disabled or neurodiverse in prison um, being criminalised. So I think that's another side of it. Maybe Nami, you might have more to say about this sort of how we can create connections between constituencies as well. Um, I think all of that is kind of part of what we need to do to address these, these issues. Thank you so much. I mean, I think one of the issues is that we are often taught that whether we're talking about racism in the system, whether we're talking about um, disabledism in the system, you know, whatever level of discrimination that we're talking about, we're taught that it's an accident, that this is something that if we just reform the system, we'd be able to fix it. And that is the myth that we need to, and I think that abolitionists start from saying, actually, no, it is organized that way. It is deliberate. And so the stats will differ from year to year, you know, from place to place according you know, whatever measure you're looking at. But the reality is prisons everywhere around the world target the most disenfranchised, marginalized, socially abandoned people. And you will see that consistently. And that's, again, it's not an accident. It's part of the design. And so I think one of the things from a kind of uh, racial justice perspective and why so much racial justice and abolitionist organizing goes together is because if you want to address racism, you have to dismantle those systems that are sustaining and maintaining that. And the prison system is one of the central, I would argue, one of the central institutions in Western liberal democracies that, you know, entrenches that. And so rejecting the reformist position and saying, actually, we can never reform this because if it's not this group, it will be a different group, it'll be another group. And so we have to work to kind of uproot it and build other systems of care and support for people who have done harm or experienced harm. Yeah, was it deliberate? I think it it was partly about knowing that I was working with other people's words. I sort of, if that had been the language that the majority of participants had been using, then I'm sure it would have been much more present in the book. But it because it wasn't, it felt like, you know, and there were so many kind of perspectives, like, you know, like really kind of strong, like, uh, like feminists and queer perspectives and other, you know, 
perspective that, yeah, it just, that, that kind of um, language has such a strong authorial voice as well and has such a strong flavour that I also kind of wanted the book to be as welcoming to as many readers as possible <coughs> and I felt like adopting a particular kind of rhetorical style might make the book harder for, you know, a broad number of people to kind of engage with. I think it's an interesting question, and I would be really interested to hear what other folks in the audience think about it, because I think there's a tension between, on the one hand, there's a power in naming things as they are, um, or naming things in a way that helps signal certain kinds of things so that people know what you're talking about, and then there's also a problem, which I think is pervasive on the left, which is we use language that's really alienating to people who aren't already convinced of particular ideas, and so to me there's a time and place when sometimes you use a language that tells everyone this is a shorthand for what you know this means, and other times I think we could do a lot more to be moving to a place that communicates to people where they're at and brings people along and doesn't use kind of what I think is sometimes really alienating language. It's like how do we give people the concepts and the resources and the tools, or how do we work with those tools to find new ways of being together um, in ways that are helping rather than hindering our movements. And I think there's a time and a place for both, but I'd be really interested to hear what other people think about that. Just, just to come back on that, there was, it was, I did make a deliberate, deliberate decision not to, to use like the prison industrial complex repeatedly as a sort of shorthand as it, as it often is. Um, and, and, and that's also just because I think it obviously is a really important concept that's done a lot of useful work, but I do also think that there's a way in which it can just become a way to not think about those relationships between those different carceral institutions and you know government and big business and yeah I don't know I just wanted to leave some space make some space I think that's a really good example because I think that term when it was originally used was used to try and convey something very complex and I think that term gets used all the time now in a way that's actually sometimes uh, limits and doesn't, and people use it in a way that I think is reductive um, and misleading, actually factually misleading. Yeah. So like people say all the time they think that prisons are being expanded because private prison companies want to make money off them and that's what's driving prison expansion. And that's not actually empirically true in this country or in the United States. They're feeders, as Ruthie Gilmore says. Yeah. They, they extract wealth from some, from as a you know, as a kind of byproduct of the prisons, but they're not what's driving prison uh, expansion in this country at all. It's prison, the primary driver of that is changes to prison sentencing. Sentencing policy, we're putting more people in prison than we ever did before, and the people that go to prison we're putting in for longer periods of time. And if we want to stem the flow, you know, just tackling corporations is not going to do it. We have to tackle the government policies and the whole infrastructure that is producing um, those consequences. Loads of thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thought that I do have, just as a throwaway comment, is that similarly to working in prisons, um, I think you have the most transformative educational experiences when no one's really paying attention to what you're doing in the classroom. And, and that happens a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah. well I think, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a really big question, but um, I think like part one of the main things is that I that I feel has I found really helpful um, over the last period of been trying to sort of develop is thinking about ways in which you can give agency to young people or people in forms of education in the system. Um, to me it's like a lot of the work that I maybe sort of started off doing was especially through one of the uh, places that I work which is a, a, a black photography uh, collective called Autograph or is now a gallery and institution. Um, it's kind of sort of explicitly focused on issues around race and you know, sort of thinking specifically about how, for example, certain uh, black young people might be engaged more in sort of processes. But I think what I've started to sort of become, feel is really 
sort of more important is thinking about how do people have agency. And often one of the things that I feel like really marks a lot of education structures is the kind of taking away of agency of um, whether it's students or whether it's pupils or um, whoever. And I think that's a really, it's really difficult kind of, it's difficult to challenge it, but then it, it, one of the things that I liked kind of within the book, for example, was thinking about how do you, there, there's many sort of like inherent capacities that like young people might have, like wanting to be creative, wanting to connect with, with others, wanting to uh, be in, more in control of um, the kind of uh, programs that they're involved in. Um, and I think like I sort of see myself much more within education as like trying to facilitate that rather than trying to sort of just like um, you know sort of give give out curriculums which I think you know more and more pressure on like sort of educators and people in, in those positions to kind of give certain kind of knowledge and that's kind of partly why I think within a lot of decolonizing conversations there's an importance towards thinking about curriculums but there's also just as much a kind of importance towards thinking about spaces like what are the kind of education spaces that we're working in? I mean, if you work in a secondary school, is it? Um, you don't have to say which one. No, but I was just thinking. <laughs> I was just thinking like there's a lot of spaces that you go into. There's, I mean, there's one thing. You're one in particular, secondary school, um, where like going into the school, it felt like already like you were going into a prison because there was like really high walls, uh, kind of um, big kind of metal like barbed wire fences uh, on the top. There was some security passes to get in. There were these like weird kind of like Google campus like kind of hubs that like kids were working like kind of individually at, like as if they were like at the office or something. Um, they had to like all stand up and like say this kind of strange statement at the beginning of the lesson, which is like some kind of, I don't know, it's a bit like in America, like in America don't they have to like say the What's it called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what is going on? Like, all of this has happened before any kind of education has even gone on. So, I don't know. I feel like if we can find these cracks in these systems where we can, as educators or anyone working in those contexts, just give some agency to young people to try to create space in the way that they want, um, I think that's where, that's like what I feel is, is really important. But I do think, like, what I really like as well with the book is that I think it's quite practical. Like, I, I ran um, uh, some sessions over, well, last, last year, which were called What Does an Anti-Racist Classroom Look Like? And we kind of worked with students and pupils in the secondary school uh, and teachers. Um, and what I found really amazing about it was, like, actually, like, how simple and realizable and achievable a lot of what people felt would be transformative would be um, like really like not it wasn't like we need to change the whole curriculum and like put these authors on it or like represent like this type of knowledge whatever it was just stuff like um, we would really like to dim the lights you know that would be like a tangible thing that would actually make improve how we like exist together and like then you start to actually think about what does it take to do that and then you start to realise how that goes into all of these things around, like, you know, who who has the contract to install the lighting, and like, how can the contract be changed, and et cetera, et cetera. So that I feel like there's this kind of constant, like, backwards and forwards between, like, things that feel really imminently achievable to transform the kind of spaces that we're in, um, and things that feel really intractable because they're like very tied up with like uh, neoliberal, like, capitalist structures. But I feel like we need to have this backwards and forwards and the more that we can like engage in kind of collaborative processes with all different kinds of people, the more that we'll be able to like find the cracks and then find the challenges and then like try to work beyond them. But it does take a lot of, I mean, I don't know how long this project like went, was it two years or three? No, no. it was like less than seven years. It was one year. So it's like, you know, also just kind of reflecting slightly back to the question about like, why doesn't it also engage in like trade union, you know, like it takes so much time, like all these kind of participatory processes and collaborative processes take 
so much time. So I think if we can like start to initiate things and then see where like that can can build and can grow, I think even just starting something like small within your context, but you're probably already doing it. But um, and then sort of how that might connect with others or with other schools or with other local activist groups who are maybe organising on similar issues in the area. I think just those kind of sparks can start to kind of grow into something, but it does, yeah, it does take time and energy and resources and like um, all of those things. Thank you. It's really, I just want to say really, it's really interesting to focus on the idea of agency, because of course I, I totally agree with you, and I think that sort of agency through the way you do things or through the kind of processes that we follow in people's work is really interesting and important. But like, Schools sell you a totally different idea of agency, which is like you need to do your own little classroom exams, like get a you know get a good job, all that kind of thing, which is to some extent how society works, and like many people buy into that very understandably. So it's just interesting thinking about how you know activities are the kind of thing that are important for people to like unpin or like a little bit critically. Yeah, and posing it back to them, just like what you know asking your students what do you think agency actually what would it mean for you to feel like you were free or like to have agency and like this is certain narratives that we that you're told by the school i mean i don't know if that puts you in a difficult position with like your <laughs> your thing but like i think that kind of like these kind of like exercises of like how do you put that back to those people and then engage together in like a process of working through what that might mean because it would be very different in your context than it would be maybe in like the context of another school that has a different like demographic or different community or in a different part of the country or in a different part of the world so i think that that sort of that process of like starting to have these like kind of reciprocal kind of conversations that build through um and work through the problems i think are just really essential like processes to begin sort of initiating yeah, I think it's a really good question. And the idea of abolish the family, abolish, you know, education, abolish school, everything. We, these are the kind of conversations that we did have in the project. Um, and we had differing kind of opinions about the usefulness of, yeah, thinking about something like the abolition of education, um, or the abolition of school, rather. Um, and I think. I don't know, I guess my personal position on it is that there is things that I would want to maintain about the family and about schools, but there isn't anything about the prison that I would want to maintain. So for me, I do feel like a sense of anxiety when abolition does a lot of traveling into other areas because really I think a lot of the time we're talking about like reforming the family we're talking about thinking about different structures of support and kinship and things but there's still more that's maintained than is lost <coughs> but that's just my perspective but yeah in terms of how science fiction can help us with that yeah just kind of keeping these spaces open I guess and um, yeah but, Anyone else, or should we? What do you think about that? I mean, it's a big debate. <laughs> it is a big debate, and I, I do have particular feelings about it. But um, I mean, I think there. I mean, it goes back to this question. Like many of us were super excited when abolition kind of got a bit trendy in the sense that we're like, look, all these people are interested, and there's an appetite for it. And then also, you quickly see the way in which the depth and meaning and significance of abolition gets flattened out and gets applied to anything and gets, you know, it's the same way that people use transformative justice now to talk about the most punitive processes. And they're like, I'm doing transformative justice. And it's like, maybe not. So I think, but you know, it's not, it's not that I think we need to have some sort of purity politics. It's like, we're going to police yeah. the meaning of abolition, but it's like when it, I think it goes back to the other conversation about words, like, when do those words generate something that moves us in the direction that we want to go to? And when do they cease being useful? And so, you know, like I think about with the Bent Bars Project, we've always been an abolitionist collective, but for a long time, we didn't use that language explicitly. I mean, if you knew about abolition, you would recognize that that's how we organize and what we do. 
but there was a lot of potential problems for us, like even in terms of getting access into prisons to be able to reach people inside. If you're like screaming about abolition, it's going to cause potentially some problems for you. Um, but that doesn't mean that the abolitionist politics weren't there. So I think it, you know, I think we have to be cautious about when things lose their critical, um, not just their critical meaning or critical edge, but when they lose their critical practice. And if they stop helping us to do radical critical practice, then let's use some different terms. Let's find some different language. Let's find a different way of engaging. But to me, it's like, what are we working towards and what is helping us work towards that? What are the useful tools um, for that? I think that there's, all, there's also like a kind of practical element of that as well. It's like when words like uh, abolition or like in, in my case, um, anti-racism, or the de decolonizing become like in the level of university management. Like they're also the ones that control all the resources. So like there is this kind of like strategic way in which like, you know, um, Fred Moten, Stefan Ahani, like what can you steal from the university um, in order to do things that maybe you don't, you're, you're, you're not, you know that you're not using it in the same way as they are, but actually what can you extract? Because when you, when they're not sexy words, like, you're probably not getting anything. And you're like, the amount of, even even at this point where like anti-racism is really important, like I still have spent the, an insane amount of time like just doing basic levels of advocacy to try and get any kind of like, um, you know, job security for like people that I work with um, who are like young, you know, BIPOC, you know, graduates who are doing amazing work on these projects and like the university still kind of sees it as some sort of like charitable thing, even when they put it into their like thick, um, you know, their, their strategies. Um, but they are actually, you know, there's more resources available for that kind of work than there was before those things, you know, basically pre like Black Lives Matter 2020. Um, so there's, I think it's a kind of complex thing to navigate, but there's moments where I think that it's like strategically valuable to, you know, use those terms in a way that you can kind of get resources for the work that you want to do. Uh, but then totally agree, like you have to really think through like, are, am I reflecting this thing that is kind of then pacifying like the politics of the work or is it, am I still able to kind of like have an effect that doesn't uh, work in the terms of like management or the institution? If, if I can just like, there's one kind of quite chilling example of this which, uh, from the book which is that, um, so the book's been used in some prison based reading groups and the feedback I've got is for one of the reading groups anyway, the fact that the book's called Abolition Science Fiction isn't a problem for the prison, they're really not bothered about what it's about. What upset them is the first story in the book, which is about the PR2 system. So what upsets them is that somebody involved in the book has such in-depth knowledge of the prison and how it functions and what it does and how it, you know, manages bodies. Um, and that's what's disturbing for them. Not the word abolition. That's fine. Because we can ignore those crazy people. It's, yeah, it's knowledge that is disturbing. Do